Thank you, Kimberly. Um, our final speaker of the morning is uh, Rebecca Peskin. Becky has worked in the animal health business for 16 years. She is currently the Associate Director of Equine Marketing for Marielle Limited, managing products like GastroGuard, UlcerGuard, and Equiox. During her time in this role, she has spearheaded efforts to reach out to the equine professionals via summits that not only help educate trainers on horse health, horse health topics, but also focus on heavily on better business practices. The very first summit was held in 2013 with a group of AQHA professional horsemen and women, and now AQHA corporate partner Marielle hosts summits across the country that include trainers of varying disciplines. Becky lives in Roswell, Georgia with husband Kevin and daughter Ella. While family and work keep her very busy, she still shows in the AQHA amateur all-around events as often as she can. Please welcome Becky Peskin. Sadly, I have to move this down because I'm very short, even with my tall heels. I got the date wrong, so I started off really strong here. Apologize for that. I'm just so ahead of myself. I was going to present to you again on Saturday, apparently. But uh, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about profitability and uh, customer satisfaction. So everybody who's excited about talking about profitability, please raise your hand. Thank you for lying. I appreciate that greatly. This is not something that uh, I think we all wake up in the morning and go, wow, I want to talk about making uh, myself more profitable, or I want to talk about you know, really digging into my customers and finding out what makes them tick. It's something that we have to do. It's not always something that we love to do, but it really does benefit your business in a lot of different ways. So first I'm going to ask you a question, and uh, then I'm going to uh, make an admission. So my first question is, and I have a few hats, so if you're bold and brave and you answer my questions, a few of you will get uh, a tiny reward. So somebody tell me, why did you get into the horse business? Anyone? Yep. Great. Great answer. A little round of applause for that. There you go. That's right. And a hat. And, and I think a lot of you are going to have a very similar story, right? You got into the horse business not necessarily to become rich, maybe famous, you know, maybe well known and, and, and thought of, but you did it because you love this crazy four legged thing that we ride around all the time. You wanted to have a little piece of something like this, right? <laughs> I, mean, I think we'd all like a little piece of this one, by the way. I'd like to touch that one, yeah. But I mean, this is it. This is, that's why you get in this. It's for the love of the horse and it's for the glory and all of that that goes with it. There is not a horse person I've ever met that isn't passionate. And I, and I stress that with, you know, I work for a pharmaceutical company, but I stress that for the people that I work with and my upper management all, all the time. If we go about our business with passion, the same way horse people go about their business, we're going to find partnerships in all sorts of different areas. So here's why I got into animal health or into marketing even. First of all, it was this. This is my pony, Sesame. She may or may not have been a little overfed. <laughs> Probably was. Um, and, and then really when I got into marketing, I thought, oh, I'm going to make, I'm going to make brochures and videos and I'm going to help educate people about products and 
I'm going to do all this really pretty stuff. But what I found is that most of my days kind of look like this. I sit in front of my computer and I do spreadsheets and I do PowerPoint decks and I do a lot of the things that are circled. Budgeting, profitability, and talk about margin a lot. But the reason I do this is because it lets us do things like this. If we weren't profitable and didn't make a margin, we wouldn't have the over $1.5 million that we put back into associations like AQHA, USCF, USDF, all of those different associations out there, as well as back into the veterinary industry. And when I tell you that that's a pr very significant part of our operating margin as an equine fran franchise, it is. We know that we have to put back into the marketplace. But, but really what drives that is, is profitability, et cetera. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Who can share with me, um, what, what are your professional goals? Anybody want to, somebody raise a hand, have a goal they want to share? Anyone? Don't be shy. Come on. Gretchen? Respect. Respect. Absolutely. Great. Can you uh, share a hat? Absolutely. Anybody else want to just shout one out? You don't have to be so brave. Professional goals. God, you guys are professional horsemen. You got to have some goals, right? Respect. Help people. help people. Okay. All right. I'll help you out. I think a lot of you would probably agree with a lot of these. You want to work nice horses. You want, I mean, listen, we all don't want to sit on the, the slug. We want to sit on some nice horse flesh. You want to have a lot of customers. You want to make a consistent profit. Maybe that's not a goal you think of, but it certainly needs to be a goal of your business. And you want to generate repeat business. And eventually you want to enjoy some time off and you need to plan for your retirement. And that's where the profitability part of this really comes in. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not standing up here saying, uh, you know, don't, the only take home message today shouldn't be that, you know, I need to forget about everything else and just be more profitable. But to continue doing what you love to do, what you just talked about as your passion, you do have to make sure that you can pay your bills and that you have something to retire on. So that's really what we're kind of talking about. So today's objectives. Talk a little bit about exploring profit drivers in your business. I will give you a caveat. I'm giving kind of two things combined in one today. And generally, when we do this session at one of our trainer summits, can anybody in here raise your hand if you've been to one of our Marielle trainer summits? I know there's been a few in the room. Okay, a few of them, some of the people left. Um, so uh, we generally do this in about a two to three hour block. So I'm gonna try to jam a lot of this. And we also do it in a lot smaller groups. And there's a lot of interaction and discussion. So I've kind of tried to make this into something that we can do in a room full of people and, uh, and we'll try to bust through it pretty quickly. But think about the different profit drivers within your business, the prices, pricing of your services, the number of horses you have in training, the sales commissions, anything else that you have that drives, uh, that drives profit. What financial value do your services deliver to your bottom line? We'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally, driving customer satisfaction without losing that profitability. Because I think a lot of times we think that those two things don't go hand in hand. So I want to talk about a really boring but important subject called pre-tax profit and understanding what really drives that. So just to define pre-tax profit margin, it's a company's earnings before tax as a percentage of your total sales or revenue. We'll, uh, we'll share slides later and you don't have to take a bunch of notes. But bottom line, your pre-tax profit affects your cash flow, your business growth, affects your future Social Security earnings. Anybody else have any ideas of what this would affect? Anyone? I know I'm the last speaker right before lunch. You've been sitting for a really long time. It's okay. It's okay. We'll talk about it. So let's talk about income sources. How about what are income sources for a training for a training business? Just yell them out, guys. Lessons, board, training, sales, commissions, shipping. Yep, absolutely. Horse shows, right. So I think I've probably got most of what you yelled out there. Board, training, show income, stud fees, sales commissions, winnings. Other stuff, do you do schools, clinics, things like that? Um, pass on expenses, because that is part of income when you're working on your, on your, uh, your actual sheet. How about expenses? What are the type of expenses that you all see? Feed, insurance, tax, equipment. Sometimes it seems like there's a lot more of these, right, <laughs> than that other list, unfortunately. So yeah, feed, barn and show supplies, labor, mortgage or rent, truck and trailer, insurance, uh, property and barn maintenance, and, and just general. So, and don't get real tied up into the numbers that I'm showing you here, but I just needed to, to sort of pick some numbers to kind of show, okay, let's talk about this income versus expense and how you can affect those lines. So I'm gonna make some assumptions. This trainer in this, in this scenario retains their board. So in other words, they own their facility. So the board money comes back to them. They have an average of 10 horses showing 
more horses in training, 30 horses in training, and it's a mix of weekend and major events that they go to. So we're going to say that from board training and day fees, they, the income for this business is about $444,000, which you're like, hey, that's pretty good, right? And you got another $10,000 from clinics or lessons, et cetera, and another $25,000 in sales commission. So total income for this business is you know, just shy of $500,000. You're like, wow, that's awesome. And then you look at this sheet. <laughs> and then it gets scary. Don't run from the room, please. But you start looking at all the expenses and you realize that you're down here at not that far off what your income was. Now, just so you know, we did roll in the wages includes your wage. That's you paying yourself within your business. So if you look at that pre-tax profit, income minus expenses, 32, this business made $32,000 for a year. So 6.7% of the total revenue. So what's wrong with $32,000? I mean, it's better than zero. <laughs> Worse than 100. But you know, how many years is that profitability maintainable? So you need to start thinking about that. Is that only maintained, we talked about this earlier, at the peak of your career? You know, you gotta work your way up to that maybe, and maybe in the end you kinda work your way down from that. Are you at capacity? Do you literally have any more hours that you can go out and work? Can you afford to hire more people? Are you making enough money to expand? A lot of times those two things go together. You, can't, you wanna get more horses in, but you don't have any more hours, so you need to get more people, but you need to have profit to be able to get that. So it's really a cyclical type thing. So what else? It also, uh, it also affects your loan eligibility. So the, the profitability of your business is, are you, if you need to go invest in your business, buy something new, piece of equipment, piece of property. Um, and really, can you build a retirement income? So these are all the type of things that you need to start thinking about. And the bottom line is that it, for this particular instance, it takes 93.3 cents for every dollar just to run this business. Okay? So it really doesn't leave a whole lot of room for anything major to go wrong. So let's talk about how we can make some differences in that with just pretty basic thing. And I'm going to talk about, we kind of, we term it the 1% difference. I'm not talking, you can, you can obviously run these with a lot of different percentages, but if you just made... If you just increased your prices or your, the prices of your services or your commissions or, or other things that you have as income by 1%, or on the flip side, if you reduced your expenses by 1%, what does that 1% end up meaning to your bottom line? So I've actually run some examples. So let's talk about if you increased your board and training income by 1%. So up here, you see that. This is our base. So and that's this, this is the same business that I showed you the numbers for earlier. So this particular business, as is, the pre-tax profit was $32,000. By increasing board and training 1%, you already in you increased to 36, just, just shy of uh, $37,000. It was a 13.8% increase from a 1% increase in board and training. That's a pretty big difference when you start seeing 1%, like a small change up here, and the effect that that has on the bottom. So how many people have uh, folks that ask for a multiple horse discount? Anyone out there? Yep, absolutely, of course. I got two horses, I should get a discount. So let's assume you only discounted by 1% for that second horse, okay? Or 1% across the board because you got lots of people that have two horses. So now, same type of scenario, looking at a 1% decrease in board and training. Obviously it decreases your profit and now you have a 13.8% decrease in profitability. How many of you are only gonna discount 1% for the second horse? I'm gonna bet it's gonna be more than 1%, okay? So you just have to be mindful of how those things affect your bottom line and affect your profitability. Because guess what? Y'all don't do us any good if y'all go out of business, <laughs> okay? We need you, we really do. We don't always think we need you, but we need you. So, uh, so it's really important that you um, that you are uh, remaining profitable. So I threw this up here um, just because I think it's an interesting chart. So if your business operates on a 20% margin, that five, so if you do a 5% reduction in cost and you're operating on a 20% margin, do you realize that your sales have to increase 33% to offset that discount you just gave? How many of you think by offering a discount you're gonna see a 33% increase? No, not very likely. I can tell you from the business world, when we offer that, we're not, it's really hard to get 
a 33% bump in sales from a discount offered. It just is. That's just uh, that's why it's business. So think about it this way too. What would that 1% increase in, in board and training look like to your customers? I'm going to just take a, I took a wild stab and said, you know, a bunch of different folks in the room, but it's probably anywhere from 12 to 20, maybe even more dollars per month. Do you think they're really going to bulk at 12 to 20 bucks more a month? I, I would I would tell you that most of them won't. And if you're not increasing, I'm don't leave here with that as your take home. And I actually have a caveat for that later. Please do not leave here and go, well, Becky Peskin said I should raise my fees 10%. I will have a lot of hate mail coming to me and I don't want that. But I but we do, it's really important to realize that you know, that, that small percentage, Rob, and I see you in the back there, definitely don't, uh, don't yell at me later. Um, but uh, really, it's a, within 1% to 5%, you're probably not even going to get somebody that blinks that hard at it, guys. And it means a lot to the bottom line of your business. So you really need to think about that. So let's think of this a slightly different way. Can you save your way to prosperity? So what if you reduce your expenses by 1%, right? Not always that easy to do, but... Maybe you can find some ways to do it. Maybe you uh, shop around for, oh, my clicker's not working. Shop around for a little bit better deal on insurance. Maybe you forego something new from your equipment, your truck and trailer, some administration costs. So now a 1% decrease in expenses on the same thing is a 3.4% increase in profitability. So not nearly the effect that that 1% increase in price gave you, right? That was 13 plus percent. So what if we did both, okay? In a perfect world, you become a little bit more profitable by increasing your fees a little bit, but you also try to work and lower the, your expenses. Again, I'm not going to get too big in here, but you end up with a 17.3% increase. So do you see how very small changes on income especially can really mean a pretty significant amount to your bottom line? Make sense? All right. So that's really... It's really what we're kind of talking about with that profitability. So I encourage you, are you being diligent? Okay. How often do you, and I know this isn't fun, I have to do it all the time and it's, I really thought I was going to get into this job and I was going to make pretty things and I was going to talk to people and it was going to be all flowers and fun and then I realized that really I have to sit down and do my due diligence. I have to make sure that we're profitable. I have to make sure that we can pay for our sales reps, that we can pay for our cost of goods, et cetera. And that's, you know, that's just part of what I have to do. And it's the same thing for you. So how often do you reevaluate your expenses? Do you look at it per training horse? Do you look at it per lesson horse? Think about what, what it costs to have those horses in your business. And it's going to change. Feed prices change all the time. Fuel prices change all the time. So if you're not reevaluating those, you could get a big surprise because your profitability has gone down and you haven't adjusted the top side of that. Reevaluate your mix. This is something else to think about. What do you need to do more of or less of to be more profitable? If you do those other services, clinics, judging, etc., you know, are those more profitable than just training one horse or than the lessons that you might give? You might need to readjust your priorities of what you're spending your time on. But if you don't look at it from a business perspective, you have to do it to keep yourself sane also, but if you don't look at it from a business perspective, you could be, again, surprised in a bad way when it comes time to look at profitability. Do you know what your operating margin is? So, you know, even if you just kind of do it on an average horse basis, so an average horse I have in training that goes to, you know, X amount of shows, et cetera, a year, you know, what is my margin on that horse? Again, these are just important things to sit down at least once a year and look at your business and the health of your business from that perspective. What are you missing? And I, I have a, an, an interesting story here. So are there expenses that slip off the radar at horse shows? And I promise you that there are. I'll use the example of a, of a um, consultant that talks to veterinarians. And he tells the story of when he was early on in practice, he was a single mobile practitioner, and he really wanted to hire tech, but he just couldn't afford to hire a tech. He couldn't wrap his brain around it. So he had a friend that said, hey, let me ride with you for a week in your truck with you and act as your tech. And let's see if, you know, if I can help you out enough that I can pay for myself. The very first day, at the end of the day, they looked at their little tally sheets and, you know, what he had invoiced and what she had invoiced. $400 difference. One day. $400, just stuff that he pulled out of the back of the truck 
and forgot that he pulled out of the back of the truck and didn't charge somebody for. Still on your expense line, guys, but you lost it on the top part. So be very, you know, find ways that you can not miss stuff like that. So really the keys to profitability are growing your business, obviously, maintaining or increasing prices, and truly managing expenses. So I'm not going to bore you with any more profitability talk, but I will um, talk a little bit sort of about this next leg of that. And that's how can you maintain those prices and even increase those prices in an economy that I think we can call touchy. <laughs> Does anybody want to say touchy is a good word for the economy? I won't say that it's, it's stagnant. I think there's, you know, we're seeing an upswing certainly in the, in the horse world, so that's great. We're seeing increased participation and things like that. But, uh, but we certainly, um, it's not, uh, it's maybe not the glory years that we saw probably 10 plus years ago. So really, I think it's about creating satisfied customers. And, and, and that comes down to a value proposition. And this is any business. It's not just obviously the horse training business. So what makes a happy customer? Okay, It could be the top left, which is just going and showing at the big show. That big show could be the silver dollar circuit. That big show could be the world show. It could be just the one big circuit in your state every year. That definition's a little different to everyone. It could be winning at the big show, like the gal on the top right. Or it could just be hanging out at the barn with my four-year-old and trying to make the pony not bite her. <laughs> okay, but you really got to know your customer base and what makes them happy. So your value to your clients depends on what? Anyone? What's your value? What does it depend on? Satisfaction. All right, thanks. Steve, you got a hat up here. Anyone else? Enjoyability. I'm sorry? Enjoyability. Enjoyability. Very good. Oh, my button didn't work. And need for you? Need for you? Sure, absolutely. So quality of the service you provide, your professional reputation, your location could be part of your value, your ability to produce a winner, certainly your ability to sell horses or select horses to buy, the professionalism of your employees could be the value that you provide. The bottom line is it's just like any other business. It's price versus value. It's creating a value, and they'll be less concerned about the price of that if they're a more satisfied customer, for sure. So funny that Kim talked about this earlier. How many of you have ever surveyed your customers? I didn't see too, too many hands. Couple, okay? I strongly encourage you to do a customer satisfaction survey because, and I'll use myself as an example, my goals as a rider five years ago, six years ago, are very different from my goals as a rider today. Mark's laughing. I have a four-year-old rug rat that's running around like a crazy person on a regular basis. I have an insane job that puts me on an airplane two or three times a month. I would love to say I'm going to go win a world championship, but quite honestly, at 40 plus, that's a lot less likely than it was five or 10 years ago. <laughs> so my goals have changed. And, and you know, that needs to be a conversation that you have with your customers because you need to understand, you know, at this point, sometimes it's just getting away and going to a horse show for a weekend. I don't want to suck, but, you know, I'd like a, to win a little bit here and there. But, you know, sometimes it's a little different version of what it used to be. So... Do you know what your customers think about you? What do they think about the, the care that you take of your horses? Is that, that might be the most important thing, by the way. It really might. It might just be knowing that when I show up, my horse is shiny and fat and looks like he doesn't hate everybody. That could be the biggest and most important thing to me or to, the, to one of your customers. Your people skills, the services you provide, your public persona, your staff, your reputation, the barn and equipment you have, what is important to your customers? You need to know that because if you're focusing on the wrong thing, you're decreasing customer satisfaction. What are their goals and what's most important to them? I can't encourage you enough you know, to do this because if you had an issue, would you know you had an issue in time to head it off? And I'm gonna say a lot, a lot of times, and it's again, no, no different in any other business, you don't. You don't know you had an issue until it's too late and now it's big and ugly and hairy and you got to figure out how to fix it. But if you can start asking ahead of time and figuring out what people want and where the sore spots might be within your business and your customer base, you might be really surprised how quickly you can squash that stuff before it happens. 
again, Kim, with great minds think alike. Uh, I don't know if my mind's great, but your mind's great. But uh, SurveyMonkey is super easy to use. It's free, basically, unless you want to get real crazy. I encourage you to go on there, throw some questions up, let it be anonymous, let it not be anonymous. Maybe some things you want to ask anonymously, maybe other things you sit down with your customers on a regular basis and you ask them face to face. But guys, you will be shocked and surprised. We had a story come out at our first trainer summit in uh, a, a few years ago, and it was one of the uh, professionals sharing the fact that all of a sudden they were losing a bunch of customers, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. And so they finally picked up the phone and called some of the people that left and said, why'd you leave? And they said, well, because Susie is a giant pain in the ass. One of the other customers, I'm throwing the name Susie out, by the way. And we just didn't want to deal with her anymore. And we didn't feel comfortable coming to you, so we just decided the easiest thing was to leave. Okay? Susie is a problem. And if Susie's a problem, maybe you need to get rid of Susie. Now maybe you can't get rid of Susie, but, but at least you need to know what the sore spots are so you can try to address them before you lose a bunch of customers. So customer service, how important is it? It is the competitive edge. Guys, I... Personally, I think customer service is the way you differentiate yourself in any kind of business. I don't care if you're selling widgets, if you're selling medication, or if you're selling your training services. It is absolutely the difference that you can make. Think about where you get good customer service. Think about where you get poor customer service. And think about the service providers that you're willing to pay more for or drive further to because they give you better service. And aspire to be that. Figure out how to be that. So when competitors are e evenly matched, it really is the business which stresses customer service that will end up winning. I truly am a believer in that. So just as a quick review, you have to be profitable. Uh, you need to be diligent. You need to review your income, your expenses, all of those things on a regular basis. I know it's not fun, but you got to do it. You owe it to yourself for sure. Know your business, know the drivers of your business, know what parts of your business are the most profitable and the least profitable, and maybe you still do some of the least profitable stuff because it's the stuff that you love, and that's okay, but you gotta know it and be aware of it. And finally, know what drives customer satisfaction. Know what makes your customers like you, know what you need to work on. Okay, now a blatant word from your sponsor because they did pay me to come here. Um, first, and I'll reiterate, if you do increase your prices, do not blame me. Do not say, well, Becky from Marielle said, because I don't want to show up at the next horse show and get yelled at. Second, we do have resources as a company. Uh, in, uh, in last year, we did eight what we call trainer summits or education sessions across the country. And these range from a one evening, one topic type thing that we've done in certain areas all the way to what we call a full summit where we bring you in, kind of does a meet and greet the first night, have a full day of sessions, usually very business focused. I know there's people in this room um, and at this convention that have been to some of our summits, so I encourage you, Steve has been the one, so I encourage you, uh, talk to them and, uh, and find out more about it because we have now nine equine specialty reps across the country and they're going to be doing uh, one of these each, some version of it, might not be the three day one, might just be the two day, uh, a one night or whatever, but they're more than happy to work with you if you've got a state association, if you've got just some friends in the area, some colleagues and peers where you want to cover a topic. We have about 20 topics we can cover or facilitate. Everything from legal contracts to insurance type stuff to uh, social security for small businesses to profitability to determining customer personality types and communicating better. There's a lot of stuff that our reps can facilitate. So I highly encourage you. My email address will be on the last slide so you're, um, feel free to write that down uh, as well. Third, an extra blatant pr plug, we do have great products. <laughs> um, so please use them. Because uh, that helps me keep doing this and us supporting things like this. Um, and we even have some other ways to help with your profitability. Um, how many of you in here, uh, so uh, we'll use Ulcer Guard as an example. How many of you pre-purchase, whether it's this or maybe an NSAID, Butte or Equiox or whatever you happen to use, how many of you buy that in bulk and then bill your customers? Raise your hands high. Ah, okay. How many of your customers pay you the same day? 
none, right? Okay, and, and that's okay, that's part of the process. A, don't forget to build them, okay? Please don't forget to build them. But we also have something new that I think might be really helpful to you. It's called Marielle Max. Max stands for Marielle Awards Express. So this is a digital submission and tracking of equine and cattle rebates. We have cattle products as well. Um, how many of you uh, even knew that we had rebates on any of the, if you use any of our products? Any of that, thank you for raising your hand. Okay, great. Okay. So we offer $5 per syringe if you buy it through your veterinary, a little bit less if you buy it through um, a different source because we know that some veterinarians don't carry the products. Um, usually not in the big um, the big mecca areas, but um, so we offer a five dollar rebate per syringe on those two products. We offer pro rebates on all of our equine products. And now instead of mailing in, thanks Steve, you're on top of your game. Um, instead of mailing that in and waiting six to eight weeks for a check, you can actually follow this little process. This is you right here. Uh, you go to a website, you enroll. When you enroll, it sends you either an email or a text that you can download an app on your phone because everybody loves apps. Come on. And uh, so the next time you buy your ulcer guard, we'll say you bought, you uh, simply open up your app. You scan the invoice from your veterinarian. You scan the barcode on the back of that. If you don't have the product right in front of you, that's okay. You can hit a drop down menu and say, I bought, you know, seven syringes of ulcer guard. And then you hit submit. And in the wonderful digital world, that sends that off. You're going to get something right away that says, hey, thanks for your submission. You'll be able to track that submission right via the app. And then if you so choose, you can, you can get a check mailed to you in six to eight weeks if you really like checks or you think the bank teller is cute. Um, or you can get a reloadable debit card. This is usable anywhere the Visa, a Visa card is used in the U.S., and that debit card, uh, it'll actually have the balance right on your app. So you open up your app, you can see any of your submissions. If there was an issue, you can fix it. You can see what the balance on your card is. That card, now you can go use for gas. You can use for et cetera, you know, all these other things. So really a nice opportunity, $5 per syringe. If you think about how many of some of these products you might use and you're paying for them, you know, whether you pass that along, that's certainly your opinion or your, your option. If you have customers that don't pay you so quickly, maybe you don't want to pass that along. That's, uh, that's cer certainly your call. But it gives you a great opportunity to, um, to have that and, and reduce some expenses because you're now able to use that, uh, that app. Just so you know, the, um, the first time you do all of this, it'll be about 10 to 14 business days before you get the card in the mail. And after that, within 48 hours, of submitting something, that money will be on your card. So it's really quick. Something else that we're doing, and I'll, I'll um, pass this information along to Patty and the crew afterwards. We've, after we've done these summits for the past few years, we've really struggled with how do we keep in touch with the folks that came. Some of y'all I get to see every once in a while, but a lot of folks, um, you know, we don't get a great opportunity to see them face to face. So we're working with a company called Beck Ag to create a private closed forum um, I know we've all seen some forums that have been out there, uh, but this one is invite only. So anybody that's come through one of our trainer programs will be, uh, be allowed to be invited into this forum. And it really just gives you a closed place to continue to have conversations with peers or to throw up, hey, I had an issue with this new tax law. I can't figure it out. Can somebody out there help me? And we'll bring in tax specialists will bring whatever to help you. So it's something that we'll uh, pass along the information to all of you later. We, uh, there's all of the people that have come to our forums, which are multiple disciplines, et cetera, are going to be invited into this, but we have actually created a very specific AQHU professional horseman tab on it. So that if you all um, want to be able to use that, if you've come to one of our sessions or just have an interest, let me know, we can plug you into that. Um, the moderator of this is, is a assistant trainer for a gal that shows, uh, does AQHA and APHA shows. So it's somebody that kind of knows what y'all are talking about. She'll be putting out um, weekly topics of just general, a lot of it's business related. It's not always horse health related. We try to be, our, our opinion is if your business is healthy, then you're going to keep your horses healthy. And so that's really where we come from doing all this. So this will be a resource that you'll have, uh, have available to you later too. So thank you guys for your time. This is my email address. If you don't get a response from me right away, don't be super shocked because we have a really awesome new firewall that collects a bazillion emails every day. So, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so keep at it. 
Or uh, if you tried me and you can't get me, certainly talk to Patty or, or um, there's plenty of people that have my cell phone number and can track me down that way as well. We appreciate what you do, both from a competitor and from somebody that works for a sponsor. We do really appreciate what you guys do every day. And, um, and we want you to be able to keep doing it. So thank you for coming to this. Talk to your friends about it. And uh, we'd love to come do one for you locally. Thanks. Thank you, Becky. Um, before we let out here, I'd like to thank uh, Becky and Christy and Yvonne and Kimberly, um, the Certified Horsemanship Association, and Muriel uh, for helping us put this on. Um, speaking on behalf of the council, I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you guys coming and, and being a part of this. And uh, just uh, remember, we're going to break for lunch, and then um, the Industry Issues Town Hall meeting will be across the, uh, the hallway here after, after at 1 o'clock. So um, thank you so much for coming, and uh, the, the staff at AQHA, thank you guys for helping us put this on. We really appreciate it. Thank you.